evolved and it became much broader, you know, with um, the, the wider community, um, specifically the community of our borrowing uh, or our borrowers. Um, and so there was a view, well, actually, you know, if there's events that we're hosting for our community, there's projects that you might be managing, and there's um, things that you're doing that are having a tangible impact to the bottom line in addition to communications, then, um, you know, the role should, uh, the title should reflect that. So um, that was really the, you know, the, the rationale behind changing it. But I think, um, yeah, for certainly for people who, I mean, I've seen growth, you know, head of growth and other similar titles yeah. in, in other fintechs. And I think it's to kind of demonstrate its growth to the community, its growth to the ecosystem, um, its partnerships, it's, it's very, very broad. Um, and, you know, I mean, we have a lot of fintech uh, geeks at the company. I'd say I'm probably one of the, the biggest fintech geeks here. Um, and, you know, and your, not... your smile, your smile just gave it away. Like that was well, yeah. like, there you go. So, <laughs> exactly. so we are now, we are now officially live. I don't want to cut yeah. you off. But we, we stalled really good there. And we're like, we're, we're digging into what's happening. And today, um, you know, we'd like to welcome everybody to another scale up Valley podcast. And what's exciting about today is we're talking about lessons learned while scaling. So this is what our little drawing looks like. We are, we are, we are, we are going to fill this out with everything that happens over the next 30 minutes or so. Now, my name is Ryan Fullen. I'm a keynote speaker. I get excited about making things simple and that uh, takes me around the world. Uh, I've also got a new book about being more human. So uh, simplicity and being human, those things connect. But today we're talking about growth and you just heard the tail end of a question. Should everyone add and growth to their business title. And Valentina, you are a perfect example of how that works. And we're going to dive into that. But I don't want to steal the mic. I want to give the mic to Mike. Mike, you have the <laughs> mic. Let's ask Valentina some questions. <clears throat> Let's get that smile to confess her geekness and get all that we can uh, as she has um, not only used communication, but how she is involving growth in what she does so we can all learn a little bit. Mike, the mic to you. Thanks so much, Valentina, for joining uh, me and Ryan and the audience, of course, for to share your experience uh, in the fintech industry. So, um, yeah, why, why don't we start to, to to know more about your career until now? I know that you joined Oaknorf almost since the beginning, uh, and we've been evolving with the company, uh, which has raised it. If I'm, uh, if the crunch base data is accurate over 1B at this stage with investors yeah. like SoftBank um, among your investors. So which was yeah. quite impressive. So, but let, let's get to know more about yourself first before going to- open. Yeah, sure. Um, well, okay. So kind of going back to literally the very beginning. Um, so my mom is actually an entrepreneur. Um, she founded uh, her own business um, when she was about 29 years old. Um, I'm, you know, had she had four kids, she was a single parent. Um, so she really, you know, had to have a lot of grit, a lot of determination, was a real opportunist. And, you know, she's still running her business today, um, 20 years later. So she's um, she's done a, or 25 years later. So she's done a phenomenal job. But I think um, that gave me from a very young age a real respect for entrepreneurs. And I think that's why when I began working with Rishi and Joel, I was so drawn to them because they are, you know, fantastic examples of brilliant entrepreneurs. Um, they, they started their first business in their 20s, Copa Lamba. And then over a period of 12 years, they scaled that to uh, 3,000 people across 12 markets and sold it to Moody's Corporation in 2014. And about four years into that business, they had been looking for debt finance to grow because they had reached, I guess, the, the scale up phase. So you have businesses that are in the startup phase um, and it can be uh, you know, it can be a, really a challenge to get equity finance because maybe you haven't proven your business model yet. But once you get into the scale up phase, which is where I say you're, you know, you've proven your proposition, you might be profitable or certainly very close to profitability, then actually, you know, securing equity finance isn't really the challenge anymore. Lots of people want to throw money at you. Um, the challenge comes more actually if you say, I want to go for debt capital. Um, not because banks wouldn't be willing to lend to you or peer-to-peer -peer lenders wouldn't be willing to lend to you, but more because the process tends to be very, or traditionally bank lending tends to be a very painful process. And that was certainly the experience that Rishi and Joel had um, about four years into scaling their business. And they were looking for, for capital. And this was back in 2006. So before the days of peer-to-peer -peer lending or crowdfunding, we didn't have the very broad 
um, uh, financing landscape that we have post financial crisis. And you know, the best offer they could get was from from a UK high street bank was 100k, and only if it could be secured against Rishi's house. And they were sort of like, you know, I don't understand. Look at our cash flow. We're a profitable business. We've got an amazing client list. Surely there's something else you can do. Um, but there just wasn't. And then over the next 12 months, they went to the US several times and they ended up getting a $10 million dividend recap from uh, Citibank. And that essentially gave them the ability to scale the business without having to dilute, which is obviously as an entrepreneur, something really, really important. Um, but that, you know, sorry for that digression, but it's just to explain about, you know, that's how the kind of the bank for entrepreneurs came to be. Um, mm -hmm. And the whole premise behind Oak North wanting to help um, entrepreneurs and growth businesses scale and achieve their, their ambitions. So that was why from the very beginning, I think being the daughter of an entrepreneur, I was very drawn to a company that was helping entrepreneurs um, and that was providing them with the finance they needed to scale. So this is back in 2015, uh, the summer of 2015. So Open North uh, in the UK had just got its banking license um, in March um, and wouldn't launch until September. And I was a consultant, and then I was seconded um, shortly after our launch, so around uh, November time. And then after a few months of being seconded, you know, it just became very clear from both sides that there wasn't only a need, but also very much a want, uh, you know, for me to join full time. And so, uh, you know, we had a conversation, and the next day I had a contract. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> You know, like everything at Oak North, it tends to move very quickly. But I think, um, you know, obviously uh, that was very, very early days. You know, we up until sort of September 2015, when we launched through to, uh, well, before the Brexit vote uh, in June 2016, our loan book was 98 million pounds. So, you know, less than 100 million. Today, we've lent over 3 billion. Um, we have hundreds of customers, you know, businesses that you can see on the high street, businesses that you might eat at, at for lunch or that you, a hotel you might stay in, you know, a nursery where you might put your kids, a private equity firm that you might have got investment from um, and so on. Um, and then obviously on the other side of the business to help fund our lending, we have, you know, 40,000 savings customers whose uh, deposits are helping us to, to fund our lending. Um, but also, you know, the model that we did was quite different in that, you know, what drives Oak North's growth, what's enabled it to be so successful in the UK was the machine learning technology that it's built on. So our, our platform, Oak North Analytical Intelligence. And, you know, when I, when, when I was first working with Rishi and Joel, the plan was to use the technology to build a fantastic bank in the UK. And that if we could do that here in a highly competitive and highly regulated market, then rather than taking the approach that a lot of other fintechs do, which is let's try and get a banking license in multiple markets, actually mm -hmm. let's license that technology to other banks in other countries so that they can replicate open or success with SME lending in the UK in their own geographies. So in a similar way that you might see at the smaller end of the scale where you have and financial cabbage, you know, funding circle, lending club, iWalker, et cetera, they're focusing on loans on average of tens of thousands of pounds. Once you get to that next stage of growth, where you're talking millions of pounds on average, I mean, we start at half a million, we go up to about 40 million in the UK. And then through licensing the tech, you know, our partners will typically start at half a million up to about $30 million um, in, in, in US currency. So, um, so that's sort of the, the model. Um, and I think for me, it was, you know, the fact that I could kind of get in very, early stage. I think, you know, I did a business degree at university and a lot of my friends, they went on to work for very large institutions, you know, KPMG, Deloitte, Accenture, etc., um, which are all, you know, great companies and, and have lots to offer in, in different ways and it appeals to different people. But I think for me, I always wanted to go somewhere small, start early and then be, you know, have a really tangible impact on the growth of the business um, and be there when it was, you know, well, before it had its first client in Oak North's case, through to where we are today, obviously over a billion dollars raised, as you mentioned, from some very significant investors like GIC, like SoftBank's Vision Fund, you know, like uh, Coltrane, Asset Management, Claremont Group, et cetera, um, where we have a 2.8 billion valuation. And I mean, again, I'm not, not to get too kind of hung up on valuations, um, but obviously, you know, 
once you you get unicorn status, you tend to uh, you know you tend to get on the radar a bit more. So from a yeah exactly. So from a from a communications perspective, it's been a real journey because you start off kind of speaking to people, you know, potential partners, journalists, other stakeholders, people within government, and they're sort of like, oh, okay, well, you're just another challenger bank. You know, the first new challenger bank in 150 years was Metro Bank back in 2010. Mm-hmm. We were the third. And as you know, since then, there's been many players, Starling, Monzo, Tandem, Atom Bank, um, you know, a, a very, very long list of about 25 more, I think. Um, but once you kind of move into, you know, the coveted unicorn status, you do have a, uh, a different spotlight on you. And that's been really, really fun and a great journey to be on. So sorry, that was a really long answer, but hopefully it kind of wanted to do it. It was amazing because you already covered uh, why Oak North, what Oak North is doing, how it differentiates from the different players in the fintech industry. So mm-hmm. you kind of told us all the story uh, yeah. about how it also connects your personal life with with the uh, with business purpose. Yeah, Oak North. And what is the size or the ad count of Oak North at this stage and what was when you started? So when I joined, we were probably about 40 people, um, but I was the first sort of marketing communications hire. Mm-hmm. I think it's quite normal um, and certainly for any, any you know, startups, fintechs that might be listening, I don't think there's a need to have from the very beginning in-house support for every role, right? You might not have like, for example, an in-house legal counsel when you first launch you you might rely on you know a law firm or you don't necessarily have an accounts team you have an accountancy firm that you use or you have an accountant that you go to and it's as you scale that you then feel the need to actually build a team internally who have a specific dedication to um you know doing the needs of your company full time so um i think you know that was uh you know that was there was definitely um a need to to kind of yeah have me on at that at that particular time and I think um you know now we're 300 across the group so we have 300 people which mm-hmm. actually is pretty lean um considering our our size um and that's really as I said across the group so that includes you know Oak North Bank in the UK that includes um Oak North Analytical Intelligence which has offices in New York Singapore, Istanbul, Gagao, Bangalore, Shenzhen, and London. Um, Here in London, oh, sorry, in the UK, we're also expanding our lending team. So one of the USPs um, about borrowing from Oak North that's quite unique is that we invite every borrower to come into credit committee and meet the decision makers, the the people who will be making the decision about their loan face-to-face. So we use the Oak North Analytical Intelligence platform to help us generate a credit paper, which is essentially a 30 to 40 page document that has all the information we would need. You know, how did that sector fare in the last economic cycle? Um, how is this business compared, you know, to its peers in terms of cash flow, in terms of footfall? Obviously, this the variance will depend on the sector, and the, the data you look at will depend on the sector. Um, so if it's like a, a property, for example, it might be like price per square foot and you know how have pli- how have house prices um, changed in the last decade in this in this area, and so on. So um, they, we use technology to kind of get that data together, um, and that's the open up analytical intelligence side. And then that helps us uh, to do loans much to transact loans much more quickly. But we still rely on a human as part of the process. They will make the decision ultimately, and as part of that, then unique experience inviting the borrower to come in. We're, as we continue to expand and we're getting borrowers now, you know, we, we have borrowers, you know, as far north as Scotland, we actually said there's a need based on looking at the pipeline to hire people um, in different regions of the UK. So we've always had a, a, an operations team based out of Manchester. Mm-hmm. We're now expanding that team to include debt finance directors, you know, so people who will be helping to transact loans and meeting cl- borrowers. And we're also um, making those hires in uh, two other regions in the UK as well. And we'll continue to expand um, you know, our footprint nationally. Got it. And one of the issues that we always discuss in, in the podcast is related with prioritization and mm. how to define the big rocks or the main priorities for each quarter 
for the year or the midterm. So uh, I will not ask what are the main priorities and how they have evolved for the business itself, but for you, the growth area. Um, so what were your main priorities in the beginning and, and how they changed it to what they are now? So if you can share, of course. Yeah, sure. I mean, so I think probably what's less interesting is the, the numericals because we haven't really had a, a very normal economic period. So it's a bit hard to, um, you know, to, to say that we were ever anywhere close. I mean, you know, we, we were obviously very mindful of the fact that we were coming to the market as a new lender, mm -hmm. knowing that um, at the time, 90% of, and this is according to the Competition Markets Authority, um, some data they did um, three years ago, uh, that 90% of SMEs go to their business current account provider as their first port of call when looking for a loan. And if they get uh, rejected, then they often don't go anywhere else. They just say, oh, I'm going to put my growth plans on hold or, you know, I'm going to maybe go and find an equity provider, but that will mean I have to dilute and I'll lose, you know, a, more control of my business, whatever it might be. They'll, they'll find another option or they'll just, you know, decide not to pursue the growth plan, you know, if they're owning a restaurant, they'll just say, well, you know, we can't get a new site yet. Or they'll say, rather than getting two or three new sites, we'll just get one. Because we can only afford one based on our own um, cash flow. So there's then things like that. So we we were, you know, anticipating that it would be um, a real challenge. And it has been, but I think our expectations have, um, you know, have been much, we're, we're probably our expectations were much lower than what the reality has been. Um, because as I mentioned, you know, we launched in September 2015, uh, and then through to June 2016, our loan book grew to 98 million pounds. Um, by the end of that year, it had tripled to 300 million pounds. And that wasn't because, you know, we were suddenly lending to a bunch of businesses, you know, that we wouldn't have lent to before, or that we were taking, you know, more risk. It was actually that as a result of the Brexit vote, larger lenders and actually indeed smaller lenders, I mean, Virgin Money as an example, um, before, before the acquisition discussions, you know, said they were putting SME lending on hold. And many of the larger banks um, retrenched from the market. They just sort of said, oh, you know, we have to deal with passport and we have to deal with potentially relocating thousands of staff. SME lending is just not a priority right now. Um, or they're, they're looking at other, you know, parts of their um, balance sheet where they perhaps perceive a bigger threat. So for example, um, on the transactional or current account side, you know, very easy to switch your current account, takes seven days. Um, there's lots of players in the space now, lots of FinTechs, Monzo, Revolut, Starling, and they're losing customers to these providers. So they're saying we need to invest in improving our current account offering so that we can compete with these guys. And SME lending just sort of falls at the wayside. Um, and so that has enabled us to, you know, achieve even more than what we had set, which was already pretty ambitious goals. Um, so from a growth perspective, I think, you know, as I said, my role sort of changed over time. Initially, I was hired as a head of PR and marketing. And then over time, through events that we hosted, through events that we spoke at, through different projects that I was helping to manage, there was a view that actually PR and marketing seemed a bit uh, narrow and didn't make the connection between, you know, the comms and the growth very clear. Um, and so then uh, that was why over time my, my role sort of evolved and therefore so did my, my job title. Um, but I think, you know, we, you know, as a business, obviously, as I said, when we first started, what, where my focus was, was on, you know, establishing ourselves as a really good lender in the UK demonstrating how we were different. So speed being key, we use technology to do loans in a fraction of the time that it takes larger banks, weeks rather than months. Transparency, so we give every borrower the chance to come in and meet credit committee and discuss their borrowing needs directly with the decision makers. Flexibility, so rather than, and I going back to what I said in the very beginning, Rishi and Joel were told when they were looking for a loan, you know, for their first business, will only lend to you if you have a property to secure against. Well, it's a very archaic view. A lot of businesses, a lot of business owners don't have a property, but they have other assets in their business. Stock, debtors, plant and machinery, intellectual property. They might have alternative assets like art. 
one of our clients is an art gallery down on Bond Street and we have security against four of the paintings in the art gallery. Now, that's very different structuring alone that's very bespoke and very customized to a business is something that you can find, but not typically at the mid-market level because banks aren't willing to take the time to properly understand and properly underwrite your business when they're getting a 1% arrangement fee and it's a three or four million pound loan. They've got bigger fish to fry. They've got billion pound or hundreds of millions of pounds of loans to do. So that yours just goes to the bottom of the pile. And as a result, it takes several months to, to get a loan, even if it's a no to get an answer. And that's, that's where you see the opportunity. Yeah, so that's exactly. So that's where we, you know, we saw a really great opportunity in that sort of mid-market range through those three USPs. And then one that kind of came about which we, we haven't really gone to market selling was that we're entrepreneurial. The fact that we're founded by two entrepreneurs and not two bankers makes us, you know, means that we're having a conversation in a much more real and honest way because we're talking to other entrepreneurs. It's entrepreneur to entrepreneur rather than entrepreneur to banker. And so it makes those conversations a lot more fun, but it's also, you know, it makes those conversations, I think, a lot more productive. And, and very different to what you'd find in, in a traditional bank experience. So what we found is then now over the years, we have hundreds of entrepreneurs that we've lent to, and we, you know, through the, the growth um, team, uh, do a number of events throughout the year to enable those businesses to meet one another. So we might host events specifically for entrepreneurs in the restaurant and leisure sector, or for entrepreneurs in wet-led businesses like bars, where they don't sell food, you know, so... How can you take advantage of specific trading hours? You look at businesses like Notes Coffee. Um, if anyone's familiar with Notes Coffee, they have, you know, a site uh, in, in Canary Wharf Station, in Bond Street Station, in Victoria, another one in Canary Wharf. They've got about 10 sites in London. And, you know, a really, really smart business. One of our borrowers, they are a coffee, you know, a cafe by day, a coffee shop. So they sell like a few pastries and coffee and then at night time they turn into a wine bar and then have an amazing selection of wine and then do like cheese platters and meat platters so a great example of a business that then can take advantage of daytime trading as well as nighttime trading um, and so it's taking the time to understand these businesses and the assets in the business and how they've structured things how they choose their sites using technology to underwrite them really well really quickly and then getting a human to sit down with them and make a final decision. So that's kind of how we differentiate ourselves and that's what we do in the UK. And then outside of the UK, we license that technology to other banks so they can you know, hopefully improve SME, their own SME lending in their own markets. And how did you structure your team to kind of execute on this main or these key priorities that you have for the business? So I think the first thing to say is that your team is likely to change dramatically as you scale. Um, you know, the, 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 the right team um, in the early days, like before you've even launched, before you've got your first client, before you've got your first institutional investor, before you've got your banking license, is probably going to be a very different team to once you're actually a fully licensed entity. Certainly, it could be very different to once you get to the scale of a billion dollar valuation and you have, you know, huge investors like SoftBank's Vision Fund. So I think, you know, it's about um, hiring people who understand that, you know, the company will evolve and change. And hopefully, you know, like me, your role might evolve and change as well. But also there might be some people who, you know, really want to be there and are a perfect fit for the really early stage when you're going through, you know, the application to become a bank. And that once you get the application and you've got it approved, then they say, okay, great, I'm on to my next challenge. You know, so I think it's about appreciating that, uh, you know, people have different needs and different ambitions and you have to, you know, hire, you can't be wedded to the same people. And I think, you know, certainly we've seen a few other fintechs who've had some challenges because they, you know, perhaps haven't uh, evolved the team, you know, as quickly as they should. They haven't made certain hires because they've just been growing so quickly. They didn't really realize that they needed to hire certain people. Um, or grow certain teams, um, you know, and there's been some headlines obviously recently with a couple of fintechs who've, who've had that experience. Absolutely. So, and, and how, do you, how do you keep your team aligned and, and focus it on, on those key priorities? So, how, do you have so, weekly meetings, monthly meetings, or how it works? 
So yeah. I think, you know, we, I mean, we have, I think it's very unique here in the sense that, you know, a lot of company, I mean, every company I've ever worked for has mission, has a mission and mm -hmm. has values, but, you know, beyond your like annual review, you literally never hear those values spoken, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, right. it gets your like document and it says, you know, one of your values is, you know, let's say move fast and break things as your mantra. Or whatever. <laughs> and, you know, and then you're sitting in the review and they're like, so tell me an example of how you like, or, you know, tell me how you're living and breathing this. Mm -hmm. And, right. and then the rest of the year, you just don't hear about it. I think one thing that is really unique here that I've found is that, you know, the values really do seem to be like part of the everyday conversation. Um, and, uh, uh, yeah, and I think that's 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 quite a key part of it. One thing that a lot of founders always ask is, how can I get my team to care as much as I do? You know, how can I get them to be as invested in the business um, as I am? And I think that's the key word, invested. You know, lots of fintechs, lots of businesses give employees bonus shares or um, equity, you know, when they join, that's vested over time. Mm -hmm. That's fine, do that, we do that. But we also give employees the chance to actually buy equity in the business. So minimum buy-in is five thousand pounds. So it's not, you know, so much money that it's impossible for an entry-level employee to to participate in. And I think when you give someone the chance to put their own hard-earned cash into a business, it just totally changes the mindset. You know, then then they really do behave like an owner in the business. They really behave like a shareholder. And as a result, they're going to negotiate that much harder. They're going to care that much more. And they'll also be invested for the long term. One of the things that Rishi and Joel always say is run your business like you'll be running it forever. And that's another thing. We don't ever talk about exit here. The only thing you'll ever hear it from Rishi and Joel is, well, I want to run this business for like the next 20 years at least. You know, it's. So there's no like, oh, we're all going to get our money, the IPO, you know, or we're going to we're going to sell or whatever it might be. You know, it's and again, this is where I think, you know, the kind of not getting too focused on valuations, but actually focus on the value you're delivering. Um, you know, because then hopefully long term, the valuation will follow. Um, if you look at our market, it's a seven trillion dollar market. And that's why Rishi often says Rishi, our co-founder often says, you know, a 2.8 billion valuation is modest. <laughs> you know, talking about a seven trillion, uh, seven trillion dollar uh, global market. Um, but also, what that means is that we're really at the beginning, right? Um, whilst we've obviously achieved a huge amount, I think this is still absolutely the beginning for us. And um, for anyone who's joining now, even if you know they're employee number 300 and whatever, um, or 400 and whatever, or 500 and whatever you're still really joining at a very early stage because we've helped hundreds of businesses. There are hundreds of thousands of businesses globally that we can help. So we're very much at the tip of the iceberg and have a very exciting, but very long journey ahead of us. I've got a quick question, just jump in, Mike. So you talk yeah. about value and valuation and investing and turning your employees into, you know, having more meat and potatoes at yeah. the dinner table. But can you tell me how your company's investing in the personal brands of your employees? Because this idea that you're going to be in business forever sometimes might be juxtaposed this fear of investing too much value into your employees so that then they leave. And so what are your thoughts on investing into the employees as in, you know, you talked about turning employees into investors, flip that. What are, what are you doing as an, an employer to invest and become investors into your employees? Yeah. I mean, it's a really good question. I think, you know, there's a lot of people who, I mean, like myself, you know, who have personal um, ambitions or personal qualifications that we want to go for. So, for example, you know, last year I did my um, my certificate in investor relations. We've had people who, you know, who are on legal contracts with us, who are training, you know, to, to get their legal qualifications, people who are doing that to get their um, accountancy qualifications. So, um, you know, the company does does invest. And I think there's always a view that hopefully if you're investing in someone and you're investing in their career development and their professional development, that they will, you know, stay with you, uh, you know, and they'll want to, to be with you throughout your growth. We're not really um, fans of kind of locking people in, um, you know, and saying like, you know, you have to do this. And, and then that means you have to stay for like two years, because unfortunately, then 
if it gets, you know, if the person gets to a point where they're, you know, they don't, they no longer feel fulfilled or they're just, they want a new challenge, then you're keeping someone there and it's not good for you and it's not good for them. Um, so I think it's the biggest thing is about ensuring that the team, that team members always feel, um, you know, that they're, they're actually, you know, well, seeing the impact that they're having on the business, but more so seeing the impact they're actually having to the customer. Um, mm, and so if you look at our engineering team, for example, one of the things that is so interesting, you know, if you look at, um, if you were to go and work for Google or Amazon, you'd be like engineer number like 20 or 30,000, right? You would probably never meet the founders um, or the CEO. Um, and you might see them, you know, in person one day at one of the conferences when they're like standing on stage, like launching the new iPhone or whatever, right? <laughs> um, so a uh, very, very different experience for an engineer who comes here and is working directly with the founders, you know, is part of a very small but growing team and has a real impact on the product that's being developed, the tech that's being developed, and they have the opportunity to build it with the customers. So Open North Bank is a customer or a user of Open North Analytical Intelligence, the platform, but then we have banks in eight other markets around the world who are using it and who can then say to the engineering team, these are some of the things that we think need to be improved. This is how the product needs to get better. And then they can get that feedback directly and build it. And that makes it so much more fulfilling. You know, if a bank is telling you, we've spoken to our SME customers and this is the feedback they've had, and then is feeding that back to the engineer who's then getting to go and build something that's going to mm -hmm. have a adverse Im or a, a significant impact to that bank that then in turn will have a significant impact to the business. And if you look in the UK, you know, the 3 billion we've lent, that's created, directly helped to create 10,000 new homes of which 9,000 are affordable or social housing and 13,000 new jobs. So you can see a really good positive impact. And you can also see the impact you're having in terms of competition in the sector. So if you look at Lloyd's, for example, the third, the third largest bank in the UK, one of the, the biggest lenders, you know, they've pledged between 2018 to 2020 over that three year period to do 6 billion of lending. So 2 billion a year. We did 1.2 billion last year. And that was a 160% increase from 2017. So assuming, let's just say we stayed stagnant and we did the same 160% increase this year and then 160% increase the following year, we'll do more lending than Lloyd's. Interesting. And we're a bank that was three years old, that's four years old. Um, and I think that's the point. It's that people will feel very, very fulfilled when they can see they're doing, when they're having a really significant impact and they can see no matter which department they're in, this is what my contribution is meaning to the overall business. And that is what, that's what then what it's meaning in turn to the, the customer. Yeah, I like the tie into not only investing in them and their professional skills, but getting them as components within the actual process where they're seeing the results, which creates fulfillment, which will yeah. create sticky so they stay longer. I like and it. I All think right. that's really important in this sector, especially because the products are very intangible. Right, right. right. Um, it's not like, oh, I know I'm having a, like if you're an engineer who helped build the iPhone, well, sure, because everyone's walking around with them in their hands, billions right. of people. Um, but when you're talking about fintech, it's different, um, you know, because the product often isn't isn't tangible. It's something that you can't really see or touch. It's just something that everyone has or that they're connected to. Absolutely. So um, yeah, and coming back to the to the topic of the podcast, so scaling lessons of Walk North. So yeah. if you need to summarize just three points or the three main lessons uh, since you started in 2016 uh, as part of the team or even before uh, on a freelance basis um, what would you say okay well I think I've already shared some already right so yeah. you know the fact that your team is likely to change as you evolve so you know um, learning and learning that and appreciating that that the right team at the beginning might not be the right team once you you know have huge institutional investors once you're a billion dollar company once you do an IPO once you do a sale a merger acquisition etc um, then it's uh, um, run your business like you'll be running it forever so because of that you'll make decisions for the long term 
and you won't have, you know, short term thinking. You mentioned earlier about, you know, kind of quarterly cycles, quarterly targets. This is something that is unfortunately comes, you know, from the US because you have quarterly re um, reporting if you're a public company and they mm -hmm. sort of say that this encourages short termism and there's a big debate around that. But, you know, the idea that then, you know, you might have a, a CEO who's hired and they know they're going to be like, you know, on average, like three or four years of the company, then unfortunately, they're not necessarily thinking um, for the long term. So thinking for the long term, because then you always make the right decisions um, for your business and for your customers and your, your team. Um, third one, make your, your employees owners. You know, if you want them to behave like owners, if you want them to care as much as you do, then give them the opportunity to do that. Um, and uh, and I think that's that's really important, and not just in the way that you give them bonus shares that vest over time. You know, I think there was this, um, you know, the Silicon Valley TV show, and they talked about this joke of rest and vest, where you end up getting people who just literally come to a company and then like wait out their six years for their shares, and they're like, great, I'm off. You know, again, that's the wrong mindset. I think it's, you know, if you're going to do that, great. But I think giving employees the chance to actually buy equity as well is, is really key. And then a couple more learnings. So, um, you know, making sure that you choose, you know, the right investors. And I know that's easier said than done, but I think it's something that's so important to Rishi and Joel because, you know, between them, they still own more in the company than any other uh, of our investors, than any of our investors, sorry. So, you know, as entrepreneurs, and this goes back to their first business about wanting to get debt finance rather than equity finance, um, you know, it's about being owners in your business. And what you don't want to do is get to three or four years in and you have like 3% of your company. <laughs> I mean, sure, 3% of a $2.8 billion company isn't bad, but then you're not really the owner of the company. You're not really running the company and you've not even run the company for half a decade. So I think, you know, it's about finding investors who will continue to, you know, who believe in you as, as founders, who appreciate that, you know, business models will evolve and change, um, who will, you know, who will continue to invest as the company scales. So um, with different, uh, you know, with, with different rounds, they, they will invest, they'll continue to invest as a private company, as a public company, and um, whatever it might be. I think finding investors who are with you and share that same long-term vision so it goes back to, you know, running a business like you run it forever. Amazing. Uh, I would summarize the, one of the main lessons of the podcast here. But to summarize it even better, I will pass the words and pass the mic to Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Mike. So here's and what our little you, Ryan has, has uncovered. There oh, are, wow. Oh, gosh. There are a lot of little snippets that I've taken from it. And you actually did a great job at summarizing it. But if I were to summarize, uh, my biggest lesson is, is this, this growth arrow and this idea of adding growth to your job title, because what that does is it makes you connect what you're doing with what matters. And that goes back to the idea of not only having your employees invest into your company, but your company investing into your employees mm -hmm. and this new spin on investing in them so that they see the profits uh, the intangible assets, the the happiness, the smiles on customers' faces, because yeah. if we just look at profitability and growth as just strictly numbers, you're missing the human element. And you said it a few times, and I just want to recap. It's amazing to have technology, especially if it can help you scale and grow with artificial intelligence, but you have a person, a human behind it. So I think this yeah. mix of using technology but taking a step back and making sure that you have human eyes on it is something that really is sustainable growth. So you're not just sort of getting out uh, out into the danger territory. So there you go. Uh, I am now a blankety blank blank and growth. So uh, <laughs> Mike, you are a blankety blank and growth. And the <laughs> idea is just to find what is actually growing and not yeah. forget to look back and see how it's blooming. So this has been a lot of fun. I challenge people to continue the conversation with you. Um, are you okay if I tell people to find you, follow you online? Yeah, yeah. You? I mean, um, I'm on all the, the usual places, you know, um, Twitter at Val Christensen, LinkedIn. Um, obviously, if you want to find out more about either company, openauth.com um, or the tech platform, openauth.ai. Excellent. And I have a feeling there are a lot more lessons to learn from scaling. And that's the thing. Scaling creates scabs and scabs create scars and scars is what actually <laughs> makes us who we are. 
So yeah. thanks for sharing some of the insights of what's happened. Mike, thanks again for pulling all this together. And if you want to find more of these podcasts, go to scaleupvalley.com where they are all there for you. Leave a review, like it, share it. This information will only grow if you share it. So there you go. All right. It was great to meet you. And we'll